I want to thank everybody for showing up. You know, at 10 o'clock in the morning, most skydivers are still a little hungover, right? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's I think it's fantastic to, to get together and talk about safety and figure out what we what we haven't really examined enough, you know, as a sport. Topics of conversation that really can make a difference. This is the time, you know, the, the sky makes a terrible classroom in, in a lot of ways. This is how we do it. So oh, have we lost her? <laughs> My own host. <laughs> Hi. Yeah. How so, um, how did you want to do this? Did you want um did you want to just present or did you want me to oh. ask the questions? How well, I, I, I mean, I, I prefer a dynamic sort of Q&A conversational thing. It's, it's much more fun for me. But, um, okay, great. Awesome. Did over some questions ahead of time. But, you know, a lot of people don't realize this. Like when I do Skydive Radio or something like this, I don't like sit here with bullet points and read off the notes. I, I, I breeze through the questions ahead of time, maybe. And then I just go. And it's just so much more fun. <laughs> yeah, cool. <laughs> Throw the pilot sheet, see what happens. All right. So um, if anyone has a question, um, but what I thought we'd do is we did get quite a few questions from the group. So we might start there. Um, and then um, while we're chatting, if anyone has any questions, um, we can, um, yeah, like I said, pop it in the, the Zoom chat or um, unmute yourself or raise your hand. Um, so some of the topics, some of the topics, were uh, um, canopy awareness and, mm. and confidence under your wing. Under so, your what sort of so tools would you give yep. for people, um, yeah. Brian? Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, for me, awareness is uh, is about having number one the the calmness to take in more information. That's that's the for me when I'm really in intense mode, whether it's setting up for, for a run on a swoop course or just you know trying to land on a target, um, I, I have a little less room uh, in, in my awareness for unconsidered possibilities. And the calmer I am, the slower I'm breathing, the more I sort of deliberately widen my scope, um, and it's the, the safer I am, of course. And so when I find myself in an intense moment, you know, where I'm setting up and maybe there's traffic all around and yet, I really want to get to that the entry gate perfectly. Um, for me, it's it's about putting the canopy in the brakes, taking a deep breath, letting it out slow, starting to feel good, and start to to expand my my scope of uh, of awareness to you know behind me, below me, all of that stuff uh, to like you say the unconsidered stuff. That's what gets you. You don't get into a canopy collision with somebody you knew was there. <laughs> right, and so uh, I think awareness is partly about changing your physiology so that your brain is capable of taking in the new information, uh, and not so you know kind of hyper fixated and able to switch between you know I'm looking at the target, I'm looking it straight down to see my migration across the ground and get a sense of the wind, and at the same time I'm glancing at altimeter, you know, and so you could well within there's the traffic and, and all of those other things. What about the airplane that might be coming in on approach? All that stuff. We don't mul multitask. That's the, I think that the idea of multitasking is a lie. I think that we're cap what we're capable of doing is 100% focus, or maybe 90% focus on what we're looking at, and then an awareness to that there's something else to look at next. And so you 100% do this and 100% do that, and you just keep changing and you never stay stuck, you know, like the tunnel vision of the mind on just one thing. Um, and that that model has really saved my life many, many times. I'm sure it has for many of you as well, where you just don't get so married to your your thought process, your your flight pattern or anything else that, that you're uh, not paying attention in, in a wider scope. Um, the other part is to, to have a plan for everybody in terms of the flight pattern. Where are we gonna be? And how are we going to be approaching the target so you know where to look, you know? So to have a, a state of expectation reduces the task load, right? Uh, you don't have every jet coming to the same runway from all different directions. It's all very consistent um, in, in aviation in general. And it, and it helps us to kind of reduce our stress load so that we're able to take in that third thing that we didn't think about, right? 
I'm looking at the target and then I catch you, it doesn't mean there isn't somebody over here also, right? So, um, you know, when you look at the, the physiology of the brain, um, when we're really, really hyped up, high heart rate, short, quick breathing, with occasional breath holding, you know, because we're intense, <laughs> that's, that's when we lose access to our, our latitude, you know, our scope of awareness. And so as soon as we realize we're there, we just have to say, snap out of it, wake up, you know, from, from this uh, absolute focus thing and change the focus to, to the other priorities, the other things. Yeah, I don't. Hopefully, that that kind of answers that question to a certain degree. Is there more that you guys wanted me to address with with regards to that? Um, no, I think you've you've hit the nail there. Um, and I guess as far as um, talking uh, to more a beginner audience, you know, things you would recommend, um, like you just mentioned, you know, knowing the circuit pattern ahead of the jump, knowing who's on the load, um, you know, well that, that will build your awareness canopy sizes right so you look at a parachute that's above you if it's big you know as big as yours or bigger well unless they spiral you're probably not going to see them in the pattern but if it's a little canopy above you there's a good chance that you will if it's a big canopy underneath you you may get to see them <laughs> especially if you do a steep turn uh they may show up for you again so making that appraisal early on and then again uh, a little more intensely as you get to about 2,000 feet for me that's when uh, when I'm starting to really seriously think about the pattern up to, up to that point, I'm just trying to you know, stay within the wind line, uh, within the wind cone, we call that, um, to, to be able to have the freedom to explore my parachute. But as I get down a little lower, I'm not just looking at, at canopy colors, right? I'm getting a sense of a flying style. You know, is this the kind of person, if I come near them, they get so terrified that they just run away. Or are they the kind of person that you know, they run their legs to say, I see you, and maybe we can cooperate and communicate, right? To be able to, to notice somebody as one thing, but to be able to actually coordinate and approach with, with somebody else or a number of other people, that's impressive stuff. Uh, and it does come from having a structure where we have a plan ahead of time. Um, but it, oftentimes, it's, you know, you look over at them and you say, okay, maybe you do breaks or something. Um, and that's, that's why I, in my canopy courses, I think I'm probably the only one that does this. By the end of the course, I pair everybody up, even the people with 20 jumps. I pair them up in two ways and I have them fly in, you know, not, not tight formation, but close enough uh, up to about 2,000 feet above the ground to be able to, to learn how to be near somebody, get over the fear of it, and realize that there's hand signals that we can use that will tell, tell them what you want them to do. And then you have a plan for break off based on wing loading. Who's gonna go down, who's gonna go up? You know, The lighter wing loading obviously should be the one riding the brakes to create the separation. Why, why not create sustainable vertical separation, right? Yeah. Uh, so I, I think there's, there's a lot there's a lot that we talked about just within that 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 topic alone. But I mean, who do you want to be in the pattern with? The person that's terrified of seeing another canopy near them, and you know, and they're putting themselves in danger to get away from you, or somebody that casually goes, "Hey, what's up, Brian?" <laughs> you know, and they run their legs, and maybe we we talk about what we're going to do, or maybe we just sort of silently hang out together and fly together and flare next to each other. That's fine. It's just being behind somebody is a problem. Off to the side is not a problem. You know, you just maintain your direction of, of landing that you originally discussed, and then there's no surprises. Parallel courses. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, we could talk all day about um, yeah more more of that sort of style of coaching of um, getting people and pairing them up and and playing with each other. Um, yeah. Oh, Oh, you should see that when they walk out to the plane, you know, you get, you know, 30 jumps, 50 jumps, something like that. They're walking out to the plane and I gave them the full briefing. You know, I sat down with each two way and talked about their exit order and all this stuff, and, you know, break off procedures, all that. But as they walk out to the plane for the first time ever, intending to get together under canopy, they're, they look, you know, kind of white in the face, you know, they look a little nervous and not breathing well. And I just remind them, just have fun. You can always leave whenever you want to. You're in power. 
You're in control of what happens here. They walk out looking scared and they walk, walk back elated. You can hear yeah. them. They're just hooting and hollering and they're so happy. And so I think that's, that's a breakthrough. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. I do a lot of one-on-one -on -one canopy coaching and with people with thousands of jumps and they, they land like it's their first jump again. They just go, wow, this is amazing. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. And then, then when you add, you know, radios into it, yeah, it really steps it up. Absolutely. Yeah. Not, you know, you're not just doing sign language, which is sufficient. It is yeah. enough to see. Yeah. But if you can fly up in formation next to somebody and say, oh, go to a little more breaks. Let's both slow down, slow down, a little more, a little more. Yeah. Right, come a little closer. Don't be afraid. It's all right. Now I want you to take a deep breath in with me. Really big one, all the way in. And let it out very slowly. Now I want you to think about relaxing your feet. Just let you just open up your foot fist. <laughs> you know what I mean? And their demeanor completely changes. They become much more responsive and more playful. And so their skill comes out mm. because they were able to hear me breathe. You know? Yeah. I watched a video of yours recently uh, with you doing a one-on-one -on -one, uh, with, with your comms. Um, and I do the same thing, uh, travel around and, and, and it's, it is great. It's, you know, I used to yell 10 years ago and it's, you can just calm people down just by talking to them under canopy. And they're just like, wow, this is great. It's just a simple Bluetooth headset. Yeah. 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 They're, they're not terribly expensive. They're well worth the money. Yeah. And you can take somebody from that mentality of my parachute ride is something that I suffer through so that I can land safely and go and do another skydive. Like, well, geez, well, why don't you just sell your rig and spend all that money on the wind pump? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> let's love all of it. You know, yeah, let's, yeah. let's learn to, to love flying our parachutes and that's what's going to give us the skill. Let's learn how to relax under canopy more so that we can switch it on in sort of a more aggressive, joyful, playful kind of a mode. Um, that's when, when people start to really, really get better at this yeah. stuff. Yep, yep. For sure. Um, yeah, relaxing under canopy. So do you think, um, you know, talking about using different tools under canopy, um, what do you think is the most important tool? Well, I mean, obviously, our awareness of what's going on in every way is our number one tool. It's our brain. It's our ability to, to look at the situation as it is, not the way we expected it would be, right? We're transcending the preconceived notion. We're in this real moment. And, you know, looking at the ground track and go, wow, look at this. I'm sliding sideways. I didn't know the wind was that strong. I didn't know if it was from that direction, maybe, right? So taking in those little details informs the whole, you know, the flight pattern and everything else. So I think this is your number one tool. Yeah. And it doesn't work when you're nervous very well. You know, and it doesn't work very well when you're so fixated on a plan that you're being a robot that was programmed ahead of time and it's just going through its motions, right? Blindly, so to speak, um, to be able to be you know, kind of fluid with our plan and make adaptations, right? That's that the ability to do that stuff. That's to me, that's real intelligence not just rote memorization like they teach us in school. You know, you can rem remember a date and they call you smart. I think thinking on your feet is what really makes somebody smart to, a to adapt and modify and be creative, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. But you know, that said, in terms of, of, of um, inputs, I would say that, that one of the most important inputs for me as a teacher to be able to, to, to drive home the concept that you have the ability to sharply increase your angle of attack whenever you need to, whether you're in a turn or level flight, whether you flared, maybe you started flaring a little low, or you're, you something caught your attention at 20 feet above the ground, you know, another canopy or something or a camera, you know, and now you find yourself low and you have to sharpen the input. Not talking about going from full flight to full brakes in a quarter of a second. What I'm talking about is wherever you are in the toggle stroke, to give it a little bite, right? I'm in a turn, that turn is a little low, the ground is coming. I go in the middle of the turn, the same amount on both toggles, and I can instantly access my lip to be able to shove that wing to a higher angle of attack at this, at this current airspeed, in this airspeed context. And as a result, I get insta lift, right? So to me, that's, that's the big one. You know, they'll, they'll find themselves on final approach in some turbulence. The canopy 
hits that kind of pocket of air and the parachute surges forward on the pitch axis. And suddenly, it, you know, it's dropping towards the ground and it's time to flare sooner than you expected it would be. Mm -hmm. If you always flare exactly the same way, it's going to hurt on this one. Mm -hmm. But if you change it to the, you know, ready to be aggressive, Right, a short, you know, say, you know, 12 inches or whatever it is that requires is required to make your parachute instantly level off. Yeah. Um, I think that can save a lot of legs. Do you uh, reckon that would be a good technique for people to practice, you know, while they're flying around, you know, in their holding area? Absolutely. Yeah. Whether and not just I'm I'm flying along and I go rah, but also I'm in a turn, ground's coming. You know, I do this with hanging harness training in all my courses i actually set up the hanging harness wherever i am i bring what i need you know risers and bungee cords and all that stuff and i have a strap that attaches to your hips to your hip rings and so when you flare i pull your hips forward it tilts the whole system and so you get to practice leaning forward as you do this thing and i say all right start a turn lean in the harness add some toggle keep going keep going ground's coming no yell at him ground's coming and so they have to stab the brakes and lean forward and bring their knees up a bit so that they can reduce their body drag and facilitate the recovery, you know, to get you under and then in front of the canopy. Um, it's instincts that you're, you're cultivating through repetition. Yeah. Um, and so the, the winning formula of always be gentle under canopy, it works 90% of the time. <laughs> it's the 10% that your femur gets broken, you know? So you have to know when to be aggressive, when to harness your power um, and, and not be afraid of that. Uh, I'm not a fan of lifting toggles quickly, but depressing them sharply, a short little burst of energy. Oh yeah, that, that, that is extremely important mm. for safe canopy flying. Yeah, you're right. Um, you just mentioned earlier about leaning forwards um, uh, and obviously you need to have your harness, you know, modify it for that like we've got quite a few people you know yeah um so puppies free baby yeah yeah um yep. and and um you know at what stage in a in someone's jumping you know would you recommend you know starting to you know loosen your chest strap off and to to well, allow people to you know move around more freely in their harness? right yeah there's there's a number of, of criteria number number one when they land and I look them in the eyes, they can hold focus and they're not you know, terrified. Yeah. Um, so I, I wait until the adrenaline is starting to soften a little bit because this is not gonna make them feel calmer, at least not initially, right? So what personally what I do is I hang them up in a harness, you know, in their rig, I don't hang them up in mine. I clip them with carabiners or something uh, onto their three rings. And so they're in their rig and I get to find out, is their chest strap too short? Maybe they need a new chest strap. That's very common. Very is there a bungee cord between their leg straps in the right place where they're able to scoot their leg straps forward a bit and actually sit down in the harness, right? You don't know that when you're just filming their landing. So to be able to, to be right there in front of them and look at how they're using their body and see if the rig fits them properly, maybe the three rings up here, you know, and the chest strap is here, you wanna find out. And so what I do is I'll say, here, here's how you loosen it. You know, you take the tail out, you push, you lift, you pull, you know, that's a, I kind of have a methodology uh, to teaching it. And then I say, please try to fall out. I say, what? Yeah, try to, without climbing out of the rig, try to lean forward and see what, you know, where that, you know, gray line of safety really is. And always they go, oh, I thought I could fall. I can't fall out. Exactly. This is what we call experiential learning. And so if I do that, I can get somebody right off of AFF and teach them to do this stuff. If I can hang them up for 15 minutes or something and really work with them, you know, in cl up close and personal and, and tell them, all right, let's start over again. Here, stand on this chair so you don't fall, your legs don't fall asleep. <clears throat> you know, it, just give them a rest. Okay, let's, here we go again. All right, so I take the chair out again. All right, now I want you to just, you know, just sit down, get comfortable, be, you know, be, you know, sort of um, commanding your power here, not feeling like a victim. And so if I repetitively do the flare practice, leaning forward, lifting your knees, pushing towards your butt as you finish, if I do that enough, they will do it. 
mm -hmm. e even, even with only 15 or 20 jumps. But if I look in that person's eyes with 40 jumps and they still look just terrified, no, I'm not going to give them more you know, perceived risk. You know, because that could reach the point where it tips the balance where they make a really bad mistake. Yeah. You know, because loosening your chest strap, leaning forward, getting yourself in a nice body position so you look good in a picture right before you flare, it, it doesn't flare the parachute. <laughs> you know, and I have had people not flare. They're in perfect body position, they're leaning forward, they're, they're sitting down, everything looks great, and they forget about the most important part of the parachute jump. Mm -hmm. I mean, we don't even have to pull anymore. The AAD will save us. <laughs> but you have to, you have to flare, right? Yeah. That's the one last thing that's completely in our court. So, um, so I, I won't put a number on it. I can. Yeah. But to me, it's adrenaline based, and it's how are they handling the stuff that you've already given them? You know, everything. If you give them a skill to work on and they do it, you give them another skill and they do it. And you're, okay, this person is calm enough that we can add a little bit more load um, to their tasks. Um, you just, you don't want to give too much too soon, for sure. sure. Hey guys, it's, it's Ashley here. Um, so for me, it was, um, it was seriously looking forward. You know, I really struggled mm -hmm. actually looking forward when I was first starting. So mm -hmm. you'd always look down at the ground and actually get that perception, looking yep. forward, looking for that horizon stuff. So, so, um, and, and now I'm a little bit more experienced. Um, I still see that in our students as well. Sure. Um, is there an easier way to progress people to that looking forward bit? Is there any skill sets you actually teach in that space? Yeah, well, what I, I try to do is, is have them, I'll draw, you know, here's your glide ratio. Here's the triangle of where you're traveling. You want to be looking kind of in the middle of that. In other words, you're looking towards the destination point, the point in the ground that's not really moving where you're going to. And as a result of looking where you're actually going, you have more information. By lifting your eyes a little bit from straight down, you're having you know, this uh, angular perspective that gives a three-dimensional data set, as opposed to straight down, which is just a map, right? It's, it's a two-dimensional representation in which depth perception is not so good. And so you, know, you say, well, do you want to land beautifully? This is how we all do it. I don't know any great canopy pilot that comes in looking straight down because you can't do it that way. I don't know any can great canopy pilot that looks at the horizon as they're coming in either because you're not landing on the horizon, you're landing over here. The tricky bit is when you've got enough wind to arrest your forward progress and you're going straight down. That's where often you will have people looking down and I say, you've got an instrument failure. What do you mean you have an instrument? Well, your artificial horizon is the real one. And if you're looking down, you don't have an awareness of your roll axis at all. And as a result, people who look down often, in addition to flaring high and low, they tend to tip over. Because they're not aware as the turn begins, as the asymmetry of their, their flare input uh, starts to get worse, the parachute starts sloping over and they're not, they're not cognizant of that. And so by looking forward, it's going to help them with their roll axis stability. Um, so that's one of them. And I actually try to have people look forward at the relative wind, no matter what they're doing, when they're doing high performance, you know, max turns of altitude and, and trying to, you know, turn and add brakes during the turn, aggressive recoveries and things like that. I have them look forward at the relative wind and it helps your brain make sense of the situation. Because if you don't have awareness of the angle of the relative wind, the direction of the flow, you don't know which river you're paddling. In, you know what I mean? The parachute is, is interacting with that relative wind, and that's where you've got your maneuvering capability. So if you're just happening to be looking at the ground, it's a pretty picture, but it's not giving you very much uh, other than just direction of the wind and magnitude of that, that vector, right? So, yeah, I, I tend to, to always switch around lean forward enough that I'm out in front of the three rings and I'm I would call it peeking into my future as I'm making a right turn. I don't just go like this. I lean forward and I peek around into, into where I'm going to be going. And so I have the capability of, of addressing everything. I can see it coming ahead of time. Hopefully that's helpful. 
For sure. Well, like you said, it's it's practicing up high what you're going to planning to do on the gra on the ground. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Yeah. All of that stuff up high is is valuable. Uh, yeah. But usually when people pull high, they're like, oh, I got all this time. I don't know what to do. This is so boring. Are you kidding? <laughs> it's just a lack. It's a lack of creativity. That's all that is. Yeah. You need to have a plan. You go up and you say, this is the skill set I'm working on in this jump. I'm going to work on how to turn low. <laughs> let's let's try a few different versions you know uh there's, there's certainly a lot to talk about there but you just you know decide this is this is what i'm going to do maybe i'm going to utilize my altimeter you know to see how much altitude it loses in a variety of turns mark altitude do the maneuver mark altitude again extremely helpful yeah um, you know it's uh you can learn everything you need to know up there up high in a, a consequence-free environment <laughs> sure um now oh well that brings on to the next question quite nicely avoiding collisions close to the ground well i mean obviously being in a, in a predictable location you don't surprise people doing predictable things uh at each stage of the way where you know somebody sees you on the base leg in a right hand pattern they know what your next move is going to be so the, the odds of a canopy collision are reduced just by everybody flying a good pattern, which means that you have to think about where you are before you enter the pattern, right? So if you, if you consider entering the pattern as uh, the 900 foot mark, 1,000 feet or something, well, where were you at 12? Where, you were, where were you at 14? And where you were in a power position to get there, right? So that everybody is more or less flowing into, into this, funneling into this pattern in a predictable way. That said, it's the, Notice the target, notice the direction of motion, and see the surround, right? That's three big, big things. It do doesn't even include altitude, which is why I suggest having an audible <laughs> for, for canopy flight. I think they're wonderful, you know, an optima or something, um, so that you have that audible cue where you don't have to add a, a fourth thing that you need to be considering. Um, to be able to, to get yourself in the pattern and then snap out of your addiction to the target and go, what am I missing? You know, to me, that's, that's an enlightenment. It's a moment uh, that where you, you awaken from, from your objectives and say, okay, yeah, but what's more important than hitting the target, not hitting people, yeah. uh, right? Or, or not cutting them off and scaring them and then they veer off into, into a lousy landing situation because of what you did. Um, the other part is also to, to plan out if there's a lot of people coming to the landing area at the same time, <clears throat> to think about where you want to go as the first one down. Maybe you're the leader of the group, right? The lowest one that's out in front. Well, maybe you don't go straight to the middle of the target. Maybe you want to be polite and you shy to the outside, right? You take your patterns to the outside and leave straight to the next person. Maybe the next one comes in alongside you a little closer to the target and then you work your way in lanes until time, enough time has gone by where there's no more turbulence, no more interaction, and then the next person can take the one on the, the outside of the pattern. Um, to be able to, to um, sort of loosen, loosen your objectives enough to cooperate and flow well with others is very important. I mean, when we, the Hercules boogie, have you guys heard of this one? They used to be in Sweden. They don't anymore, but they used to give us a C-130 for 10 days, $20 a jump to full altitude. And, you know, I mean, they could put 196 jumpers in there if they want to. And yes, we did have two landing areas, but we didn't have five. And we just flew patterns and nobody did high performance approaches. If, if you came in too hot for your, you know, aggressing past people, they would come out and say, oh, oh, you can't do that here. You know, you're in Sweden now, it's very safe here. <laughs> and they, it would always work. It would always work. We never had canopy collisions. We, did, we didn't have anybody hooking in. Um, and we made a lot of jumps. <laughs> so uh, I think to, to have a, a, the, the idea of a flow, a flow of traffic uh, and not be afraid of it. Not be afraid to be near people. You just you sort of notice where they are and anticipate where they're going to go. And he's maybe a little faster. He's maybe a little slower. Brian Burke has has the idea that that if we have a bigger canopy and a smaller canopy in the pattern together, well, maybe it makes sense to have the slower canopy fly full flight and the bigger the the smaller canopy and some brakes so that they fly at about the same speed. Um, 
on a big way or you know, jumping out of a Hercules or something, that might make sense. A lot of people landing in a small landing area, that might make sense. But in the real world, in the drop zone, it doesn't always. Uh, and so this is where deliberately displacing your landing location can be really helpful. You don't have to land at the peak level bit. Mm. Okay. Always ready to, to just say, yeah, I, there was, it was so crowded. I just, at 2,000 feet, I made my decision. You guys can all have the target. I'm going to take a nice long, long walk and pick some berries on the way back and, <laughs> and enjoy my solitude out there. Um, you know, it's uh, it's a selfless thing to do, but I think we all will find ourselves in that circumstance. Yeah, for sure. That um, get home lighter. Sometimes you're coming back from a long spot and yeah, getting low and just wanting to make it back. Mm. Just just one because you have that in your mind that unless I achieve my objective. I'm going to be angry at myself. You know, I'm going to be disappointed with myself, and that's. I think that's part of the problem is that if you approach skydiving from a perspective of ego, you know, which can be harmed or built up depending on the roller coaster ride of performance, you know, where, where not all the variables are in your control anyway. You can't guarantee a dead center every jump. You can try, but half the time you're cutting somebody off to get the dead center, right? So I, I continue to approach that having it as I'm going to do my very best to implement my plan and I'm not going to be disappointed if, if it doesn't work out that way because I jumped out of an airplane and I live <laughs> you know what I mean it's you, you have to set yourself up with a no fail mentality um, where where there is no disappointment if you can't do your swoop I mean I get it you've been sitting in an office cub cubicle all week long and you want to do your 450. <laughs> I get that. But sometimes it's not appropriate. You know, sometimes you'll you'll feel better about having not done it. You know, uh, or or tried to make it back to the drop zone, you know, and you have to do that one last low turn, which maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. Maybe it's better to walk walk a long way than to be carried a short way. Wise words. <laughs> We have a question from Breezy, um, who's here with us. He says, um, Bree, a question I have is, when we look at glide ratio, once we know the glide ratio of the canopy we're flying, is there a parameter we can apply to the glide ratio which represents an adjustment for wind speed? Yes, absolutely. We can easily um, apply as we have the updated wind speed on the ground. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, uh, can I share or is that possible? Yeah, go for it. That'd be great. Um, uh, host disabled. So I, you might have to make me, I'll, I'll, I'll share something quickly if you, if you briefly make the host, make me the host and I'll switch it back. Is that okay? Yeah, we'll uh, make you a co host. Yeah, that'll work. Yeah, because then I can share something specific. Okay. Right. The whiteboard. Okay, you guys can see that now, right? Yeah. Okay. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go see the, the arrow here so I can draw a vector. So let's say you're the average person in terms of you know, the, the parachute design and the wing loading and everything else, and you've got about a two and a half to one glide ratio. So if you were to then draw the wind vector, right? So if, you're, if your parachute's airspeed is say, let's say 30, then your ground speed is maybe 26 pulling these numbers out of my hat, but it's, it's not a bad number. And so that parameter is easily drawn by doing this. So that's your ground speed. So if you look down at the ground, you see your shadow moving across the ground. That, right, so that's your ground speed. So if you can figure that out ahead of time, maybe you jump with the GPS, right? So you, you know that the wind today is this speed at this altitude. You can check flight service or something, and you look at your your, your GPS on a no wind day. There's a lot of ways to figure this out. That allows you to, to have the, the extreme parameters of, of maxima and minima. In other words, what's the, the fastest I'm gonna move across the ground on a no wind day? Well, on a no wind day, I'm gonna be going about my 26 um, miles per hour or so. But if I, if I have a headwind that is 26 miles an hour, I know what my ground speed is, zero, right? So if I was to cut that in half, so if the wind speed, the wind that I'm facing into is going to be, say, 13. So let's draw that on here. Uh, change color. That'll make more sense. All right, so the wind speed is now half of that. 
So here's my glide ratio. It cuts it in half. So instead of two and a half to one, it's you know, 1.25 roughly, right? And so I can interpolate to get a rough idea of the values. So this creates a, a kind of a mental scaffolding uh, that allows for what I call gut math, which is experience-based. Uh, but at the same time, if you have these, these extremes of, of, okay, well, if I'm facing into a wind that's 26, I'm not moving. If I know that the wind is only about 10 miles an hour, well, that's going to put me somewhere around here, right, in terms of my glide, which I can, I can interpolate that to be maybe, you know, 1.5, 1.6. Uh, glide ratio. So from that, what I can learn is um, if I if I have no wind and I've got a two and a half to one glide, that's this this red line right up here. <clears throat> if I'm 100 feet above the ground, how far do I go? In a two and a half to one glide, 250 feet, right? So if I have that knowledge, then I can use that to scale my expectation. It doesn't have to be numerical like this, but I think it's helpful to pull up some graph paper and just go, oh, okay, all right, that makes sense. If the wind is the wind is 20, I'm still going to be moving forward just a little bit, but it's going to be kind of a steep angle. Um, and so from that, I can say, all right, if I'm turning to final approach, you know, it might be 250 feet of progress across the ground from 100 feet, but from 300 feet, now I'm going to go 750 feet, right, times three. Is it? right, 100 foot increments makes the math easy. And so that's, that's kind of how I do it. And then I take that information and I go to Google Maps to help somebody to kind of figure out their pattern, especially newer jumpers, where they have absolutely no expectation about the size of the pattern. And, and I, you know, right click, have you guys ever done that one? Right click measure distance. That's a wonderful thing. So you have to go to maps.google.com, you find your drop zone, and then you right click and at the bottom of the menu, it says measure distance. And you just pop it on, pop a point on there and you, you'll have two points. You stretch the points out and you can measure your landing field. And you go, all right, on a no wind day, what does 750 feet look? That's the longest, you know, that I'm gonna cover uh, if I turn to final at 300 feet. And if I have a headwind that is half, you know, is gonna cut my glide in half, you know, then, then I know that I'm going to have to cut that down. So you know, it allows me to, to predict the size of the pattern. Um, so to uh, just be a little bit of, you know, playing with triangles. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we can, you know, we can science the shit out of this stuff. And instead of just being, you know, like skateboarders, they just try a stunt until they figure it out. A couple scraped elbows and scraped knees, and then they're able to do that cool ollie. But you can't do that in skydiving. You know, it's, it's too dangerous. So we have to sit down and do a little bit of homework and figure out, oh, I'm going to go to a new drop zone. We're flying to Perth. <laughs> so, okay, fine. What does that drop zone look like? So, I, you know, I zoom in. I go, all right, here's the length of the runway. That's a nice parameter to know. Here's 1.2 miles from the middle of the target. That's the furthest I'd want to get out of the airplane on a typical day where I don't have a whole lot of wind going on and, and I know I can make it back from that spot. These are all very valuable bits of information that you can get ahead of time before you just jump out of the plane and sort of try to figure it out. <laughs> I, do. I do. I mean, I don't always get to do it because sometimes it's an in-hop. Uh, and you know, we do that a lot in Scandinavia where you just jump into places uh, and only one person, the one who organized it, knows what it looks like. And that's, that's fun too. It, uh, it forces you to, to really wake up into the moment and use all your skills. Uh, but I think it starts at the drop zone uh, to be able to, to hit that target with a minimum number of corrections where you're just sailing on each leg. You're just, you know, just kind of like a skater. Just, yeah, it's, this is easy because I know where the parachute's going to go. I know how far it's going to go. You know, the wind picks up, the downwind leg gets longer. The into the wind leg gets shorter. Um, it's, it's not that complicated, is it? I think this is, it's, pre, it's pretty straightforward stuff if you, if you think of it from the perspective of science, of the basic physics, and you understand the idea of a vector. You know, direction and magnitude, that's all it's describing. It's sufficient. 
Um, and, and sometimes people are like, oh, that's so boring. I, this is my weekend. I just want to play. It's like, well, okay, that's fine. But if you want to hit the target well, you got to know where you need to turn to final. You got to know what location you need to start your turn before you enter the swoop course. Um, if you try to force a square peg in a round hole, you might find yourself <laughs> watching TV in a hospital. It's bad, bad time to be stuck in a hospital room. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Cool. Mate, that, did that answer your question, Bree? Did you have any comments? Or is, is, no, time? thank you. Thank you, Brian. That's good. Did that help a little bit? Yeah, thank you. Right. That did, that did. Thank you. Yeah, I really well, like that you had that um, graph on cue ready to go. <laughs> it's like you're waiting for someone well, to Well, I do this constantly. I mean, I, this is my third or fourth session today doing this, this kind of thing. Usually I do one on one and they just, you know, they ask me questions, I give them answers or they, they say I'm having trouble with this and I give them, uh, you know, I can show video, I can draw graphs, all kinds of different things. Uh, and it makes a big difference to be able to have that quality time where you're not at the drop zone in the, the torrent of energy and in speed and all the adrenaline and, Oh, I'm on a five minute call and all it, this way you're sitting in your own home. You know, we're speaking quietly and softly. And there's, there's, uh, I don't know, there's, there's more room for learning. I think in this environment, it's working for me. For sure. And you know, I made a lot of videos too. You know, I think that's, that's helpful as well. I mean, there's a lot on YouTube, but on adventure wisdom, you know, I, I made this one video on navigation that was relatively in depth within the, the parachute flight safety series, you know, seven different uh, videos. And I realized it wasn't enough. And then I talked for two more hours later on. It was a couple of years later. It was like, let's just do it right. Let's add all the information. And I got to the end of that. And I realized that wasn't even the whole story, uh, but at least this way people can sit down and do their, do their studies, you know, to, to, to figure out how this really works instead of guessing. You know, instead of sitting around drunk at the campfire, I know oh, what you got to do is, you know, <laughs> we've been there where, where you have people that are all trying to explain the same thing. And the one student is with their eyes like this, like, this is too much information. And it's coming in in a really weird way. And I don't, and now I feel more nervous. <laughs> so it's, uh, it, there's a lot to learn in this for, isn't it? The story is, yeah, I just had, um, uh, a canopy coach talked to a canopy coach who ran a course on the weekend and was blown out for two days out of the three but he said there's just so much that you can learn on the ground you know and then they got to put it into practice on the last day it's great yeah yep. yeah yeah absolutely and i think there's there's things that you can't learn on the ground yeah the, the sensations of it you know you can't cultivate the skill of staying calm despite the fact that you're hanging under line twists you know what I mean? You, you can't, you can't, you can simulate a little bit, um, you know, like they did in, what was that movie with the, where they're hanging them up in the harness and spraying them with, uh, <clears throat> with uh, champagne. <laughs> we missed the mattress. Anybody? Oh, Sorry. Fandango. Fandango, right? <laughs> so, I mean, you can, you can simulate a bit of stress in a hanging harness. Absolutely. You can give people written tests to see if they understand the information. Um, <clears throat> but, Ultimately, you do have to jump. You do have to jump enough that the adrenaline starts to subside, you know, that you start to, to, to feel confident as a result of previous successes uh, by, by deliberately implementing good breathing and relaxing your body and focusing your eyes in one direction for a period of time. And then you start to feel better. And as a result of feeling better, you see more, right? You're able to, to discern things and notice that canopy that you didn't see before when you were too nervous to see outside of your tunnel vision. Right. So, uh, I had a question. Great, go ahead, Janine. I was just about to invite you. Thank you. Mm. Thanks, Brian. Great chat. Um, just one of the things that I've observed and I'm wondering what sort of tips you might have is where that transition and the wind conditions change on the drop zone. And mm. even though you explain to someone that it's they've got to get into a different headspace, the, the wind's higher or lower, they still do the thing they did two jumps earlier or a jump earlier or last week. Have you got some yeah. thoughts yeah. on that? Well, yeah, well, one of the things that I'll, I mean, obviously to sit down with them uh, and, and look at a, maybe a map 
and just say, here's where I want you at this altitude. And you build that all the way up to pull altitude, you know? Here's where I want you at this altitude, this altitude, in, uh, on a, as, as in contrast to a no wind day where maybe you would be, you know, closer. But I like to have people turn into wind uh, when they get open, you know, obviously they have to look at the situation. If they're ridiculously far away, you might have to fly home for a little while. But at some point early, well above 2,000 feet, I have them turn into the wind, notice where they're actually going and see that difference, and then slowly add brakes, deeper, deeper, deeper brakes. And then you get to the point where you're not moving at all, and then you get to the point where you're actually moving backwards. Uh, because you've reduced your airspeed to your, your ground speed to, to lower than the speed of the wind. And they get, really get to feel it then. They get to see the, the consequences of the wind. Uh, flying in deep brakes and you become like a hot air balloon, right? And then you get to actually sample the wind and see those differences. Um, and then you have them do the same thing on a day where there is no wind. They, you know, they, they point into the landing direction, they slow down, slow down, slow down. And they go, wow, I'm not stopping. Well, exactly, because stall speed is well, ab well above zero. <laughs> so they get to see that difference and have them look for the destination point. I say, look straight down, slowly lift your eyes, lift your eyes until you find the zone that isn't moving up or down and hold your eyes there for at least 10 seconds. So you can see, is that really the destination point or is it a little above or a little below that point? Um, and I think that alone is, is a really nice experiential learning tool that gets them to, to, to really see the differences. Um, and then maybe turn them crosswind. You, know, you have them turn 90 degrees off the wind line, add the brakes and see where you're going. See that diagonal motion uh, and how you change it with the amount of airspeed that you're carrying, right? You slow it down, you slide more. You let it up, you're moving more towards the direction where your canopy's pointed. More, not exactly. Uh, so all of this stuff can be incredibly helpful incredibly helpful but i think there's no substitute for a really good briefing and a reminder in the airplane you know this is this is where you're going to be uh, and and maybe even grade it you just say you know here's here's the ent pattern entry point um on a, a very windy day the windiest we would allow you to jump here's the pattern entry point if it's sort of you know kind of a medium wind day here's where you would enter if it's a no wind day um i think that's uh you know, to just draw circles or, you know, like around the target and say, okay, well, here's the distance you're going to travel in, uh, into the wind for landing on a day where there's no wind, medium wind, high wind, right? And just draw the circles. You know, you I was curious, I was curious with your, your psychological knowledge, whether there's a, there's a physiological thing happening for some people in their brains where they just, yeah. There's, is there any exercises that you can do apart from all of that good briefing, which I know we've all done, but is there, is there a trigger point for some people where they just can't change their thinking? No. I don't believe that. I okay. don't believe it. But I do believe that we become very, very clingy to habit, to doing the things that we've done in the past when we get nervous like the scared monkey hugging onto your leg. You know what I mean? Can you picture that? So, th so that's what they do with their habits. We do it too. You know, whether it's you're talking about a high performance approach for somebody that's really, really skilled or somebody that just, you know, I'm a big way guy and I just like to fly a pattern and land. We hold very tightly to what we always do when we're nervous. And so therefore what we have to consider is that mood changes the human being. It doesn't, it doesn't just you know, change how they feel about it. It changes the thoughts that they have access to and the creativity that they have uh, the ability to leverage in the moment. And so to, to talk a little bit more about mood maintenance, adrenaline maintenance, you know, how do you alter the, the mood? How do you change, uh, change your, your sensations in your body? Uh, maybe drawing parallels to other things in their lives where they do get intense and then they calm themselves down, you know, driving their car in the rain or something. How do you, you know, take the deep breath? What do you, you know, maybe you sing, maybe you hum, you know, to get yourself to, to bring your mood down to a place where you feel calm enough to allow your power, to allow the power of creativity and modification from normal so that you can adapt what you're doing to what's actually happening, right? instead of just trying to do the same old, same old, because you're afraid that you're gonna get something different, something worse, if you modify too much, right? 
Um, and so I, I think that to, to be able to, to keep them moving slow as they move to the plane, as they gear up, to keep them calm and relaxed in the plane as much as you possibly can, but not just calm, but also happy. You know, there's, there's a, a place where people can go sleep you know, like, oh, you know, they're totally, totally in, the, in Tibet or something in their mind, but they're not really ready to skydive. You know, there, there has to be a, a sense of power also, isn't there? So for me, it's, it's you kind of have to go down to go back up. To, to harness harness the the sort of peaceful joyful feeling where those two places meet um, and so I, I tend to to uh, give them some free free time in the plane to Thanks, just Brian. great yeah to trip out but I try very hard to also engage them you know to make eye contact in the plane you know so that they can hear the slowness of my speech. The more nervous my student is, the slower I talk. You know? And it seems to make a difference. It seems to work. It's, it's been my winning formula for 35 years, almost 35 years. <laughs> yeah, that's really good advice. Does anyone else have any questions? Todd? No? Um, we just have five minutes left, so don't be shy, people. Um, we have... And there was also a few questions ahead of time that you had sent me. Yeah. Uh, and I was thinking I can see if I can pull those up. Uh, it was improving the canopy flight at the end of the jump. Ah, uh, at the end of the jump. In other words, um, how to fly better in the last hundred feet of the landing or is that i think so maybe you know any tips on on flare technique yeah or that's a really that, that's, that's really that's definitely more than five minutes yeah 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 and it is like you said before it is very individual a lot of you know it it is you know i mean i could say well flare a little higher flare a little lower lean forward stop throwing your feet in front of you when you flare that's why you're these are there's very common mistakes i, I made a video on that one that i originally was a presentation for uh, i don't know it was 300 instructors or something trying to help their canopy flight in holland i think it was i was like this this powerpoint is really it's for everybody i can't hog this just for them so i so i created a video called uh, solving common landing problems just one by one. Every, I mean, every canopy flight instructor, they've seen that one. They've seen that one. You know, it's all kind of stereotypical mistakes. And so if you can learn uh, what it looks like as you begin to make the mistake and then change something so that you don't do that. I think that's the answer to, is to, to have the mental map in your mind of, of if I see this, then I'm going to do that. If I see this, then I'm going to do that. And at no point do you go, ah! you know, because you always have an answer. You always stay, you know, sort of the, the clam stays open, <laughs> you know, the clam of the mind is still, uh, still open and a little bit vulnerable, but that also means that you're, you're, you're receptive to seeing what's happened and what's happening and knowing that you can solve it. You, I mean, flaring high, flaring low, low turn, high turn, all these things can be solved. Um, maybe it's not the best landing of your life, but it's safe. And so I think forfeiting the belief that you can fix it is the, is the biggest mistake that people make, where they seize up and they expect to crash and then they prove themselves right. <laughs> you know, self-aggression doesn't serve anybody, especially when you're still flying a parachute. So you keep breathing and you keep looking where you want to go, right? You look for the spaces between things and you look up the river like a salmon swimming upstream. And if you get off the wind line, you keep looking up that river. And you'll find yourself solving those problems. Parachutes aren't that complicated, you know. That goes right, that goes left, this flares, um, and this unflares. So we have to remember that one too. That's a flight maneuver. Um, and as long as we understand that, uh, that if we keep making decisions, we keep flowing through our solutions, never, never locking up, never bracing for impact, always ready to just do something else, something else beyond what you've been doing to solve the problem. Um, you can, you can pull out of all kinds of, of ugliness, you know, apparent ugliness. It doesn't mean you're going to crash. It just means you're on a current trajectory that would lead to a crash if there wasn't a pilot, but there's a pilot. That's you, you know, that's your job is to fix stuff, you know? So you come into your, your final approach, 
breathing calmly and beautifully, fully inhaling and exhaling, fully smiling and fully aware of the big picture as you enjoy the, the anticipation of this beautiful landing that's coming, uh, rather than thinking, here we go again, here we go again, here we go, right? <laughs> you can see it on so many of their faces in the last phase of the landing. They're just stiffening and expecting the worst. Yeah. Uh, so, so I think it's, it's far better to, to recognize that somebody that's in a good mood who's laughing and giggling, even if they make mistakes, they don't tend to get hurt. You tend to go with the flow of the tumble or whatever that is. But as soon as you get stiff and angry, and, ah, that's when the catastrophe happens because it's, it's the compatible outcome. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. You can't get blood from a stone. You can't get a beautiful landing out of being pissed at yourself or freaked out and powerless feeling. So you stay in a place of, of joyful power and you keep making decisions. You keep flying your parachute. Yeah. How's uh, that? Yeah, yeah. Um, you bring up another, yeah. Th um, th there is a question by Phil, but I just want to expand on that a little bit with, um, so I've had a lot of students who, you know, they, they have, when I say students, some of them have thousands of jumps, but their fear it comes from having a previous injury and they, they, they can't let that go. Um, do you have any tips um, you know, to tell those people or to tell a coach who has you know, a student like that, um, you know, um, how to overcome that fear? Because they, they you know, trauma. showed that trauma. Yeah, you know? to land, <laughs> but they still want to jump out of a plane. <laughs> yeah, exactly, I understand. Well, I, I, everybody is different in, in what works. For some of them, I, I'll, I'll go all the way to using hypnosis. Um, sometimes it's micro hypnosis, like uh, affirmations. I got this. I got this. I got this. And there's, there's, I'll have them say that under canopy. Or I'll have them sing to distract themselves from the thoughts that lead to the, to the mental gutter ball. Right? So our, our version of bowling and yours is a little bit different. We don't have grass involved, but <laughs> in, you know, the, the gutters are the sides of the bowling lane where the ball slips into it and it can't get out once it's in there. And so the mentor, mental gutter ball of trauma will naturally come up. The brain is sort of wired for expectation. When you hear a growl, you know, you expect it's a bear. It might not be a bear, but your brain automatically assumes that it's the bear. So to recognize that a gutter ball mentality is starting to happen, your job is to distract yourself into a more positive reality that is tangent to this one, right? So a distraction that is a fantasy about something that's not relevant to your final approach right now is not going to help you. But if you're dancing and singing as you're landing, you know, you're waving at people and you go, I got this, you know, whatever the words come to you that, that tap into your sense of power. I think that's really going to be very, very helpful because fear is a powerless sensation, right? You feel like a victim. And I understand that it's coming from a place of not wanting to make that happen again. But if that's really your goal, then you're going to want to go into a completely alternative mentality that is not victim mentality at all. It's a powerful sensation of knowing your canopy, knowing the landing area, knowing that you can adapt you can keep thinking on your feet as long as you stay happy, you stay loose and, and adaptable, uh, then you will do the right things that you need to do and trust that. Uh, but there's, there's uh, so many different versions of, uh, of the, the traumatic skydiving, you know, uh, mentality that I, I really find I have to work with each individual and just talk to them about what's going on. Maybe it's, it's sort of a, a lifelong victim mentality. Maybe they just totally screwed up. They hooked it too low and they broke their femur and now they're scared. Mm. That one's easier to get over, yeah. actually. It's when, when it's a lifelong victim thing or like I'm always careful and I'm always gentle and that's my winning formula. And it's how I drive a car and I'm very polite and I never call people out on their, you know, their bullshit or whatever. I'm just meek. Well, you're going to have to break out of that <laughs> you know, to be a skydiver. You're going to be a little bit more aggressive and a little more commanding of your reality. But I think that's the pushback that we need. Yeah. But whether it's a, a single data point, you know, an, an anomalous blip on your beautiful, perfect, perfect skydiving career, you made one mistake. Well, I think you can, you know, sort of wax off, you know, you just say, that wasn't me. It's what, it's not what I meant to do. I know what the solution is. It's not going to happen again. And then you have to add the positive self-talk 
because the negative self-talk is what naturally happens after an accident. Yeah. Because we were taught that fear is helpful. Oh, fear's good, right? Our parents did it, our grandparents. Don't climb that tree, it's dangerous. They want you to be scared because then you'll hug the ground. <laughs> but we're flying people, you know? And flying people have to be bold and brave and have a deliberate choice to ignore the negative self-talk stuff that, that is natural, that's old programming from external sources, from cultural sources and whatnot, and just say, no, no, I'm, I'm the commander here. I'm commanding my thoughts to be positive. I'm commanding myself to let go of anything that is negative. If it's a, if it's a visualization of that again, you know, that, that I, I saw it, who hasn't, you know, Whoa! that last visual before you hit the ground, I'm turning too low or not flaring or something. You know, or, or from, you know, dragging that nasty parachute that you should have cut away into the ground. All these things have occurred, uh, but all of them are transcendable. Mm. They are, because it's, it's in the past. The past doesn't have leverage over us. You know, it's our, it's our awareness in the present moment. That, that all the power is right there. And as long as you just keep reminding yourself, that you know how to do this. It's not that complicated. You just got to stay in the front seat of the car. You know, and not climb, not climb under the seat. <laughs> and you keep making decisions and trusting yourself. Right words of advice. <laughs> and not just for skydiving, but just for living in general. <laughs> well, hell yeah. Well, sooner or later, we're going to have to take off our masks. You know what I mean? Sooner or later, we're going to have to go out there and hug, you know, hug people. And, and somebody's going to cough, you know, yeah. when you're at the checkout line at the, at the grocery store. And at some point we're going to have to say, it's just a cough, <laughs> you know? And we're going to have to tack it with rational thought, proportional rational thought, where we're recognizing the probabilities uh, and the likelihood, right? So uh, I think that's, that's, uh, that's this risk management 101, to bring back in a little bit of math to bring, bring back a, a little bit of sense of, of how much I can affect the outcome. Mm. Uh, and, and then just let go of whatever's left and enjoy the, the, the uh, excess adrenaline that I couldn't get rid of. And just call that fun, this excitement. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I don't know what's gonna happen with this spot, with this opening, you know, I don't know. But I know I can work with it because I'm going to stay on my toes. I'm going to stay in the moment. I'm going to enjoy the process of creativity and figuring out how to do that. Figuring how to get through this, this moment with my uh, supreme intelligence to observe my reality. We're all capable of this. Sure. Speaking of which, um, I know we've gone a little bit over time, but Phil's asked a question. Um, any tips for landing tandems behind buildings in turbulence? Don't do that. Do it. <laughs> Don't do that. Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, I mean, obviously, when you know that you're in turbulence, uh, obviously, me mechanical turbulence tends to be a little more aggressive. In other words, off of buildings and trees and things like that. But um, in general, you want to fly coordinated turns. So in other words, jerking a toggle and then letting it off. That's, you're, you're causing an oscillation on, on all axes, right? You're twisting on the yaw axis, and so you surge the wing in front of you, and you're asking for an asymmetric collapse. So instead, you fly a fluid turn. Smooth in the beginning, sharper, and then smooth at the end. That'll fly a coordinated flight path with the relative wind straight from the front. You're going to load the lines throughout the turn on that kind of a maneuver. So watch your pilot sheet. That's a very helpful tool to just notice as you make different types of turns, uh, a coordinated turn, the pilot sheet wants to more or less track straight behind you. I understand with a tandem uh, drogue and bag, everything's heavier and it doesn't work quite as well as a tool as a skydiving canopy. But so great excuse to go put on your skydiving canopy <laughs> and just you know play around with, you know how do I do a coordinated turn? Well, I lean in the harness to create the roll axis change and then I add into the, into the equation the other input. But what if I couldn't use my harness, like on a tandem? Well, do I just go jerk or do I go smooth, 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 sharp and slow, 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 like that in the way that I make the turn. I start into the turn and I'm also ready to spank both brakes if I feel the, the bottom dropping out, or I feel the loss of, of lift, the loss of line tension, loss of pressurization in my airflow. 
So I'm ready to, to make the parachute try to fly away from me by adding the drag to move it to a higher angle of attack where now its additional lift will literally tension the lines if the parachute's trying to go away from me, up. So that's, that's a big one. Uh, and powering through it for sure with airspeed, it's your friend. Uh, the, I, the, the worst tandem collapse I ever saw was somebody doing a straight in. Uh, and it was a very big parachute. It wasn't flying a 360 or something. It was, it was, I think it might have been even the, that old 500 that we used to have. But yeah, he took an asymmetric and did a 180 into the ground. Uh, nobody died, thankfully. But it was, it was severe turbulence that wasn't there when they took off. And he just did the conservative approach of, of a long final. And so there are advantages to doing a graceful coordinated entry where you power through it and you super pressurize the airfoil and you create additional drag by virtue of the additional speed. And that, dra that drag pulling back on your airfoil prevents aggressive forward surges, which is essentially what causes this incipient experience, the, the, the canopy wanting to invert, whether it's asymmetric or full frontal or, or you know, frontal fortune cookie. All of those things tend to happen because you weren't traveling fast enough to induce this dynamic drag to prevent the forward surge. So come in hot. Just don't hook it so low that you, you know, risk your tandem student's life because they are sort of relying on you. <laughs> so using, using a good altimeter, a digital altimeter to do your drills on your tandem canopy, just like you would with a you know, regular skydiving canopy to figure out recovery arc. Mark altitude, you do the maneuver, mark altitude again. Do it again and again and again. And if you do it at 5,000 feet, the data is not valuable because the density altitude is extending your recovery arc. So you kind of have to do it closer to 2,000 feet uh, to get really valuable accurate data based on the, the density altitude near the surface, right? The, the crowded, draggy, uh, you know, high density air. Is that a bit tricky though when your passenger's weight, weight is changing on every jump? Yep. Hmm. It's not an easy thing. It's, it's definitely not an easy thing. But, um, I mean, especially in the, in the really ex the extremes. But if the principles apply either way, it's just that your recovery arc is going to change when you've got a teeny, teeny little person on the front. It's going to be shorter recovery arc. Um, front risers are not terribly useful uh, on a tandem. So all you can do is that nice, smooth, fluid turn power through it. And if you know that you've got a, a, a smaller student, and maybe you have to turn a wee bit lower. Um, so maybe do an experiment. You find the, light, the lightest high experience jumper to go up with you on a tandem jump and you just you know, figure it out. Maybe they mark altitudes for you. <laughs> or maybe they, they have a GoPro and they show the, the numbers. Do you ever do that one? Show the numbers on your altimeter to your GoPro. You do the maneuver, show it again, and then you can analyze later. Mm. That's good. <laughs> yeah, no fly sight needed. Uh, but yeah, you're right. It's, it is a variable that, that we don't have to deal with uh, when, we're, when we're jumping alone on our own rigs. But I think it's it's workable. It's and people do it every day. Um, but yeah, yeah, and if it's that bad, don't jump. <laughs> Even though you need the money, <laughs> that's hard. I know. But you, you you can give somebody an experience, or you can give them an experience of a lifetime where they want to come back. You know, and if the if the winds are sketchy and it's turbulent and they're on the edge of puking the whole time. Maybe that one person who was destined to become a world champion doesn't continue skydiving because they said, oh, I got nauseous when I was jumping. Yeah, there was their one jump, their one data point. And you chose to take them up when it was crappy conditions. Maybe delay and give them more of your time on the ground. You know, give them, put them on a creeper and talk about how to turn. <laughs> talk, talk about the stuff that you don't normally talk to students about, to tandem students, I should say. Um, and, and invest more, more of your time and energy in them, and it, it'll, it'll reap its returns beyond belief. I've, I've had tremendous, uh, very high percentages of return uh, in, in the way that I teach. I had my own drop zone that I opened when I was 25. And I, right from the beginning, I would teach them two to three hours for a tandem student. It sounds insane, right? 
and yet more than half of my students would come back for a first jump. Sorry, for a second jump, for a first AFF, they would come back. They just, they felt like they were a part of this. Yeah, great. Yeah, we do have a good community, don't we? we yeah, I think it, it will always be said that we come for the skydiving, but we stay for the skydivers. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Oh, that's great to end on. We're, we're 15 minutes past um, the hour. Sorry. Not that we care, not that, yeah. But um, if anyone has anything, any last questions they'd like, but um, I think we'll wrap it up. Oh, hang on. Thanks, Jules and Brian, a great session. Thanks, Janine. It was fun. Uh, yeah, was thanks so much. Um, do you have, do, do you want us to plug your, your books? I mean, you, you've got some great I, materials. I have written. Those. Hey? I have some here. Oh, Yay. here's one. If here's one. That can, more. If you have kids, Laura wrote a book too. This is my wife's. It's a kid's book. Oh, great. It's an kid's book. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's actually, it's, uh, I should show you the one with the skydiving. <laughs> she had to put one, she had to put one in here with her. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, yeah. But uh -huh. yeah, I, uh, there's a bunch. Where did I put the rest of them? I think they're right here. So for those of you who don't know, Brian wrote The Parachute and Its Pilot. And yeah. Transcending Fear. Oh, no, this is the old cover. Yeah. Transcending Fear and Green Light. Normally, I have them right here just in case I wanted to do a product plug, but I think Laura probably mailed them to customers. <laughs> it, she accounts for all of them. You can't just take it? those books. <laughs> Where can if it was up to me, it? I'd just give them away, you know? But yeah, I worked really hard on them, and, I, right. and I put my whole heart into, into all these books. Um, and they were books that I felt like needed to be written. Yeah. Uh, and the, 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 the one about fear is obviously not the whole story. I always try to warn people ahead of time. I mean, I give the basic you know, sort of uh, scaffolding of the topic, but uh, I just want people to think about it, you know, think more about how fear affects your performance, how it affects your happiness, how it affects your relationships and your job decisions, um, and just deliberately decide, I'm going to be more courageous than I used to be in the ways that matter. Not, not just like stupid risks. That's not brave, you know, base jumping drunk. That's not brave. It's stupid. But to, to, you know, maybe uh, you know, take off your mask in a couple of months and, and shake hands with a stranger and not immediately put hand sanitizer on. <laughs> I think that's going to be, uh, that's going to be our next uh, sort of, you know, worldwide evolution. And I think skydivers are more equipped than others to, to deal with that transition back, transition back to normal. Mm. Yeah, we're all looking forward to it. Hell yeah. Nice to invite you back over to Australia too. Um, you know, <laughs> the international borders are. We can we can travel again. We'd love to have you over here. So I would love to come. Well, I'm, I'm hoping that that by winter all that stuff is going to change. Um, you know, it's it's very rare that I'm actually at home this time of year. It's really weird for me. Uh, we, normally, we just we take the whole family and we just travel the world and we just teach canopy courses. Um, and so this summer has been very odd <laughs> for, for a lot of us, sure. uh, yeah. but it'll, it's all temporary. That's yeah. right. Mm. Well, thank you again for your time, Brian. And, um, we look forward to seeing you again. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming. And for those that were watching it later on, I hope that you get something really good out of this stuff. And thank you so much to the APF for, for hosting. Uh, this ongoing series. Keep it going. Even after COVID, this is great. Yeah, uh, look, that is the plan. Um, we're, we're, we're going, uh, we're doing it monthly at the moment. It might even go to fortnightly again. Um, we'll see how the interest is. And um, yeah, so um, yeah, for everyone out there, please email the APF for any presenters or um, guest speakers, guest topics you'd like. Um, and next next month we're going to have uh, a lot of people have been asking about coaching, so we're going to look at get some coaches from various disciplines and have a big chat about coaching technique. So stay tuned for that one. And once again, thank you, Brian. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. All right. See you all. Thanks for joining. Thanks, stay Brian. And wash yeah. your hands. Thanks, guys. <laughs>
Don't pick your nose. <laughs> <laughs> and flick it at someone. That's I spend that. I spend a lot of time in my house talking about that. I got the little kids. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it's good. Yeah, but if anybody has, you know, sort of, you know, casual conversation stuff, I suppose I can stick around for a few minutes for that kind of a thing. Oh, I could pick your brain all day. <laughs> yeah, I know. We were talking before about a, a new canopy that you're designing. What, what, what is it? A secret squirrel or? Oh yeah, well, I mean, I do have that, but I don't. I try not to. I, well, one of my dreams is to make something that I can uh, speed fly with and jump out of an airplane, um, which is challenging. <laughs> it's really, really challenging. Um, Cause they don't want to open right. And if they open right, then they don't want to inflate right on the hill. So you know, I'm working on that. Um, <clears throat> there's a few different mo modalities and I don't know which one I'm going to choose, honestly. Uh, but I think that speed, speed flying, speed riding is, one of the most exciting things that's that's come our way you know this this merging of being able to go hike and then fly yeah you know, are you know two of my favorite things in skiing i love skiing as well but you don't have to you just you know get the, get that ridge lift and you know there's there's speed riders now that that are efficient enough that you can hold altitude and just ridge dance you know go back and forth and so i i want to at least make something that's close enough to that without being sort of like an alea or something it's so edgy it's you, know, you got to be really really experienced to fly something like that what if i could make something that would that flew more like a speed rider but was a little bit more controllable and, and you know um less uh um yaw wobble and that kind of thing sure. so i'm working on that one as well mm -hmm. uh, I, i've been working on a, a tandem canopy and i want to make a, a, a what are the, the, my dreams is to make an airlock parachute that after landing you can actually open the valve to dump the air pressure oh yes yep i remember flying your jedi and coming back with a um yeah, big old of, yeah. the sky inside my parachute <laughs> yeah and so it's just if i want to go to a tandem that's not going to work yeah. it's too much it's too big and so the, i'm working on a number of possible valve release systems um, you know, so, he, but I'm approaching it in the way that Helmut Cloth said, you know, when he, when I came up with the Cypress idea, I want to make sure that number one, uh, it's not going to fire when it shouldn't fire. That, that was his number one goal. Yeah. And then yeah. the secondary goal is hopefully it'll save somebody's life when they're 750 feet, mm -hmm. which later we discovered was probably too low. <laughs> but, and so I, I don't want, uh, the, the valve release system to compromise the, the stability uh, benefits of an airlock canopy. I don't know. We'll see. It's working so far, but I just want to make sure that that whatever I choose is not going to shorten the life of the parachute or make it more complicated to pack or anything like that. So, um, but I, every time I see a tandem collapse and you know people get hurt, I'm like, oh shoot. You know, maybe maybe an airlock canopy would have solved that problem. Maybe it wouldn't. I don't know. And you're still dangling from lines. So well, like you said, maybe the Tanner master chose to jump when they probably shouldn't, you know. Often. Mm. Often. Or they chose to jump when it was perfectly fine and the sky had a change of, of heart. And yeah, and that happens too. Mm. Yeah, she gets mad. Yeah. <laughs> you know, once in a while. Um, but I mean, I think a lot of that stuff um, can be avoided through further education of, of tandem instructors not just, you know, hog a yanking, but, you know, how do you flow through a turn? Oh, be a sure. little bit more um, aware of the aerodynamics aspects of it. Um, yeah. yeah, I think it would be, uh, I mean, I've done a number of courses that were just tandem masters. That was fun. I did a bunch in New Zealand, actually. Yeah, I did, too. I did um, a, a trip around Australia to about 40 drop zones in Australia with another 10 in New Zealand and um, was doing exactly what you're saying. You know, it was so funny listening to you saying that. I'm like, that's exactly what I'm telling these guys to do. Just smooth in, smooth out. Because they just, they do that asymmetric to the collapse on the other side. Yeah. Like, what are you doing? Well, you do this yeah. in smooth conditions. What do you think is going to happen in turbulence? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, but if you want to kind of go smooth, 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 sharp, and then smooth, 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 smooth. Yeah, that's that's my, my way of teaching how to, how to do a sharp. Yeah. But uh, yeah, and to film them. 
interesting them videoing their landings and a lot of them have never seen themselves land you know and, i know yeah <laughs> i mean <laughs> the average skydiver has not seen themselves land at least not very much yeah. how are you supposed to get better if you don't know what you look like you know we, we film the free fall as if that matters very much yeah. <laughs> you know <laughs> it's it, 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 after the fact yeah 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 so i i, I think it would be nice to make it uh, sort of standard culture on the drop zone to have good cameras laying around all over the place you know the kind that you can zoom not a gopro yeah you know in every load every load you film it for the purpose of, of education to in, improve skill and, and add awareness where there was none yeah um, we've got some really good drop zones that do it's a couple uh, that, are, that do a stand out in australia and um yeah most loads are getting videoed and you know debriefed and and sometimes it's just at events but sometimes it's every day you know which is great you know i think it should be more more of it yeah oh it's yeah. not that hard to do um, it, it requires education that like anything else you know, the first yeah. time you hand somebody a camera <laughs> then you look at the footage you're like oh uh, I, <laughs> yeah. I can't this. I can't know. so i think to, to sit people down and actually talk about how to film landing yeah where, where do you stand you know where, where do you place the sun you know yeah what do you do at noon when you can't see the screen you know when you open it oh i can't see anything well, you know do one of these but there's there's tricks that uh yeah, the, the canopy flight instructors have figured out over the years maybe i should do a video on that there you uh, go how to film landings, to film landings. Mm, yeah i'm gonna write that down <laughs> that's a great one yeah yeah, I often in my canopy courses get someone else, like I always try and do everything, but yeah, it's better to get somebody else to film the landing so that they get practice at it. Mm. I, I do that every course. Yeah, for sure. You know, especially because now, you know, I fly with them and I mean, I might be on a 170. I'm not going to land first. Yeah. Fly, but I'm not going to succeed in most cases, especially if I've got somebody with a 120. Yeah. And so I just say, you know, I show up with three cameras and just hand them out. Yeah. I'm on this load. Can you get all of us? And I'll take one up as well because my filming will probably be better than theirs. But mm -hmm. by the end of the course, I'm bringing some pretty good video. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's wonderful. And Brian, I'm sure you've heard this before, but thanks for producing the, that video series on Adventure Wisdom. Uh, that helped me a lot when I was trying to get my A license. Oh, right on. I'm yeah. glad. Yeah. It's a lot of work. Oh, I can imagine. <laughs> and and I, I have all these other videos just, you know, just added another title. Like, you yep. know, people say, oh, could you do one on this? You know, do one on crew or wingsuit. And, oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's, yeah. I'm, unfortunately, though, my money. <laughs> yeah, it was like a month of my life to make it. Yeah. But I love the, the process of it. It's fun. It yeah. Is fun, you know, and taking in information, feedback, and then I can upload a new version of it. I get this all the time. And people say, oh, yeah, this one part, your math, I got this on one of the, the navigation ones. Somebody yep. said my yep. math was wrong. On, on one of the analysis of the, the trigger, whatever it was. And I went back and looked at it. Oh my God, my math was wrong. I mean, it wasn't a lot wrong, but it was a little wrong. Yeah. And so I went back and I edited and I fixed it. So I keep doing that. I, I re upload the videos with, with new stuff. Okay. I'll have to find the older PDF files and, and, uh, and re download them again. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if you don't have it, yeah. It, it's, I mean, I may very well have not changed since you watched it. I don't know how long ago it was. But, yeah. Uh, but I, I tried. Um, yeah. There's, uh, I mean, it's possible the passwords need to be updated for you because I rotate the password. Oh, yes, yeah. makes sense. Otherwise, people would just give, you know, give the passwords to all their friends. <laughs> I, got, I got nothing to feed my babies with. Yeah, no, it's one of those things. If, if you don't pay for it, do you actually value what you're learning? Yeah, that's right. Mm. I think that's true. I yeah. think that, it, that is somewhat true. Yeah, but Scott Average are cheap and um, <laughs> places they're, they're broke. And the bottom line is, if, if, I, if I had a choice, yeah, I'm often faced with this choice of like somebody who's you know the 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 barefoot packer with no money. Yeah, but he he's going to make that you know two jumps in a weekend or something like that. I want him to watch the videos. I want him to come to my canopy course or something like that. So it's very often the case that in in my courses, somebody say, "Oh, this guy doesn't have any money." Well, grab a chair and you put it in the room. <laughs> you know, you're in the course. You know. Uh, and, and I've had a, a number of folks over the years that just, you know, they said, oh, yeah, five years ago I did your course and they didn't pay because they didn't have any money and here's the money. Yeah. Yeah, that's sweet. Yeah, that's sweet. They're at least paying it back. 
Yeah, and if they do, they do. It's if they don't know. Whatever. Yeah. But I'm I'm doing this because I love sky apps. It's that yeah. simple. Uh, and I'm and I'm sick of people getting hurt. Um, uh, understandably like unfortunately for me i had my uh, wings clipped uh two years ago um i was in the middle of the city in melbourne and um just out of blue just collapsed in the middle of the city for no reason so three and a half thousand dollars worth of medical bills and a year's worth of uh tests and i finally get the okay that yep you're okay to jump again uh so i go to my drop zone give them the letter from the doctor saying everything's fine and then that day i got made redundant <laughs> from my job so oh oh, oh money stuff Exactly. Uh, but then I got a new job three months later uh, and then I was about to do it again and then COVID kicked in. So it's just every time I've almost gone back into jumping, there's been another reason that stopped me. And it's like, well, if yeah. you have a rig, if you have a rig, there's a way, you know? Yeah. So I always say when people are kind of in that phase of like, ah, I'm just too broke to jump. Fine. Yeah. Next time it gets windy, you pull up your wing. Maybe, you know, if you don't anticipate jumping this week, take yep. the pilot yep. off, take the slider off, and, and maybe get a, an old harness so you're not carrying your reserve around all over the place and kite. And if your parachute's big enough, you get somebody behind you, you face forward, start running into the wind, add a little bit of brakes, they push you from behind, and you rise up. Okay. And I mean, I've done it many times with like a 170 or something like that, where I'm just standing there. I'm not even pushing, I'm just holding some pressure on their lower back and their feet are up here above the ground and they're just holding some brakes. <laughs> They let off the brakes and go down. They add the brakes, they go up. Yeah. Don't do it in turbulence, not yeah. behind a building. If it's really windy, don't do it for sure. Yeah. Well, um, definitely I've got a 210, so I'd be pretty cautious. You're good to go. You're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, yeah, I would keep it, you know, not more than a, you, know, you would jump in. Call yeah. it that. And if you get that stuff down where you work on, you know, just, you're, you have the wing downwind of you, nose up. Front risers in one hand, brakes in the other. You just grab the brake lines is how I do it. I leave my, my toggles and the keepers still. And you just, you, you lift it up a little and you break it back down. You lift it up and you break it back down. You get used to, to that cycle or even front risers, rear risers. Yeah. And you build your nice wall, just like a paraglider. And you just pull it up on the front and you get it up over your head. And now you're, you're reversed, you know, you're in a 90 degree, no, sorry, a 180 from the, from the canopy heading. And you turn around your face forward. And then you, you, you do your little run. But if you're on a hill and the wind's blowing up the hill, yeah. where do you think paragliding came from? Mm -hmm. so, so your 210 will fly. Yeah. I, just, I don't think it's a good idea to do it without a friend with you, just in case. That's a, that's a good point. Airbrain pocket, you know, don't be dumb about it. Yeah. Um, God, it's fun and it's free. And there may very well be some some little hills where you can actually run, take off, and get a nice little flight, and then you hike up the hill again, get some exercise, and fly you know fly again and again and again. Yeah, no, that'd be fantastic. It'd be great to. It's only every, like at the moment the the rig's been uh, ba obviously packed away for some time, but every six months I still sort of clean it up, make sure it's all okay. But yeah, pull that main out. Yeah, <laughs> pull that main out. Take the slider off. Get the pilot sheet off of there, and kite the hell out. Yeah. Okay, not a bad idea. Yeah, well, it's better than not jumping. It's true. That's true. The the only thing that's kept me going is um every now and then whenever I've been able to get to a wind tunnel, and they've gone, oh, actually, you seem to be doing okay. The first minute you're you're completely stressed out, and then all of a sudden you, your muscle memory kicks back in. So. <laughs> yeah, that's everybody. Yeah, that's everybody. Yeah, yeah. I I think that that's a good one. The other one that I I love is is uh, power kites. Yeah, it's, it's oh, yeah. a nice free replacement. Um, I mean, the kite surfing stuff gets complicated because, you know, you're, you're actually trying to stay on top of the water. But yeah. if you go to the beach and you've got like a three meter, four meter at the very, very most, that's kind of a big one. I like, actually, I like, I like a three meter. Yeah, well, there's, a, there's actually a beach about uh, five minutes down the road from where I live at the moment. And I think there actually is a kite surfing place there. I might have to check in with them when they reopen after lockdowns yeah. over here uh, sort of out. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, you can order a power a power kite online. It's a little paraglider, basically. Okay. Um, it's not not the you know, pump up type. It's much yeah. more like what you're used to. And you know, you're out there flying the wind line, and you're learning turbulence, and you're you're got the skill of doing it. And if you don't do it right, you crash the wing, and then you got to get the sand out of it and have somebody help you launch it again or whatever. But, yeah. uh, there's it's a lot of working. I mean, it's really good exercise. Uh, you're, flying, you're flying, you know what I mean? You can't turn that off. Yeah. It's not healthy. It's not healthy. <laughs> once, once you become a flying person, you yeah. just shut it off. 
and become a bird in a cage, that's sad. Yeah. So I, I say find a way to do this stuff for free. Yeah. Uh, I'm not going to lead you towards base jumping because we know where that goes. Oh, it's well, yeah. But, Especially if, my, if I did that, my, uh, my, my, uh, my drop zone operator would probably come after me himself. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, there's no need. I went through a phase of exploring base jumping. It's just, it's too high risk. Yeah. Um, but if you have ground launching a 210, that's not so crazy. Yeah. No, I was like, I'll definitely look into that. That might just uh, just get me comfortable again. Uh, outside of that, the only thing that's kept me sane was actually oh, just playing a drone. It's a sport. I mean, yeah. it won't be just like, oh, it's kind of helping me. No, no, no. You're going to be like, I love this. The first time you run down a hill, add some brakes, take off and fly, and you're in the harness. <laughs> I'm flying. And there was no airplane. There was no money exchange, no fossil fuels, no COVID. It's a win-win. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. Never gives up. That's a great idea. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Any other things before I go to see if my babies are getting food? I have to check, check on my kids. Laura's upstairs. I'm sure she's feeding them. But. As long as I have some water left, I'm good. Yeah, I've probably taken up enough time. <laughs> I'm out of water. You're out of water. See, that's how you know it's over. Yeah. I know. And nature is calling me. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. That's a, it's the only way to end these things because skydivers just want to keep talking. <laughs> I mean, we've got the best topic in the world hmm. uh, that, that unifies us across, you know, across oceans, across languages and cultures. You know, I've jumped with, with just about everybody on this planet, and, and it's all the same family. Yeah. Isn't that great? Everywhere you go, it's, it's, it's the same attitude, the same fun loving, fearless kind of. Uh, approach to life in general not just the skydiving like the involvement in skydiving is, is a symptom of their mentality so i automatically fall in love with them the fact that they're they want to be a jumper mm -hmm. if they're not jumping yet yeah it reminds me i uh, did a i was in uh, skydive paris once and there was um a couple of people from israel and they had to return their rented um rigs back and I didn't do the last load. And uh, one of the guys came up who I was bunking with, and he's gone, look, I know we've only known each other for six hours, but is there any chance that I could, that I could borrow your rig? I'm like, don't know. Went through the rules, thought, you know what? As long as you get repacked by the professionals, we had, did an agreement. He comes running back down after the jump, gives me this massive hug. He's like, if you, got, if you ever want to come to Israel, let me know. We'll take you everywhere yeah. you want to see. And, and you, you, know, you know, you're a crash pad. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yep. Coast, yeah, you know, the whole planet can get crash pads everywhere. Yeah. The only thing that upset me was that he actually landed the rig better than me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's great. Now you know the parachute will do it. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's people from all over. My, uh, I did a trip not so long ago, uh, a few months back to Dubai. And I, I had never been to the Middle East. I mean, other than just sort of stopping in, make a quick jump and leave. But I mean, I was really there. And uh, it was amazing. The, there's like you walk around the city you walk around the small towns and the shops and you're in culture shock everything yeah. about it is different right it's like being on another planet and you get to the drop zone and you're just on a drop zone <laughs> everything i mean om almost everything you know the food is the yeah they, i mean there's guys walking around with the you know, traditional garb and eating sitting on the floor and all these things um <clears throat> i learned to you know to change from coffee to karak oh. drink. but um but other than that, it was it was uh, just like being in any other drop zone in the world. Wow. Don't go in the summer. It's too hot. Yeah, no, I can imagine. <laughs> I think it, as I saw this, like, I think the bus stops actually had air conditioners. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you have to. You got to air condition everything. Um, <clears throat> the, the hangar has you know, stores <laughs> when you walk in. I think they should have some sort of an airlock. But, the landing area is beautiful, green, flat field, huge, surrounded by desert. You know, they have to put shrubbery so that the desert doesn't overtake the landing area. Uh, I'm sure there's lots of places in Australia that are somewhat similar. You got your fair share. <laughs> like Arizona is like that too. Yeah, well, it would be. Right. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All right. Well, I'll let y'all go. Thank you so much. Unless there's any last thoughts, I'll. Uh, See if I can put some dinner together. Yeah. Well, enjoy your dinner. Thanks again, Ryan. All right. Thank, thank you. Thanks, Great chatting with you. Thank you. Yeah. Bye. -bye. Bye.